Security, I want to welcome you to our distinguished lecture series. And I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Morgan Smith uh, for the, with the uh, Y-12 National Security Complex and specifically the MNO Contractor Consolidated Nuclear Services. And I'm going to say a few things in his bio. Um, I have some connectivity there, uh, especially with my background working with naval reactors and then uh, working at Y-12. So I'm just going to go through a few things. Morgan and tee you up here. Um, like I said, Blake President, I'd like to introduce Morgan Smith. And he is the Chief Operating Officer at, uh, at Y-12, and he has over 36 years of the Naval uh, Propulsion Program, um, specifically a noteworthy leadership achievement consolidating both FEDIS and the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory, which we call uh, Capital uh, in those days. Mr. Het Smith had direct management of Capital and co-managed back the Marine Propulsion uh, Corporation leading approximately 7,000 employees and about $2 billion of naval reactor uh, component work. Uh, he served as president of Becker Bettis and general manager of Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory, where he managed and oversaw new, new reactor propulsion plant design, um, seeing a lot of that, component design and testing, materials development, and testing technical support procurement of all U.S. Navy reactor cores and new ship construction and operating fleet support. Uh, says here in his bio that he obtained hands-on technical and operational experience in high-hazard manufacturing facilities and various nuclear reactor component operations. Well, sir, uh, I can tell you that firsthand uh, at Y-12, uh, getting right back in that high-hazard stuff. Um, so <laughs> he has a BS degree in civil engineering from Penn State. And so join me. Pleasure welcoming Mr. Smith and our distinguished. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I always, whenever I hear it, I conclude what it really says is, anymore I can't hold down a job. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sure take anything I have to say within the spirit that you're hearing it to, from a guy that just keeps moving around. But it, it has been my pleasure to work in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. I'm certainly honored to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight I would say that me being here is sort of a misnomer. I'm not distinguished. I'm not really a lecturer. I'm just an operator that tries to get by. I'm not even a nuclear engineer. As the introduction said, I'm a civil engineer. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that story of how I've gotten there. But at Consolidated Nuclear Security, uh, we are very closely tied with the University of Tennessee. We're very proud of that tie. We actually employ over 600 grads out of this fine university. And that is something that I think is an outstanding statement. And that alone is a pretty strong connection to a university. When you have that much talent educated by that university coming to your place to work. As well, we do have a memorandum of understanding that we signed just recently. We celebrated that signing. The hope there is really to expand the collaborations and some business systems. Certainly technology transfers, we have the opportunity to go out into private industry. And so a lot of connection here with the University of Tennessee. I gotta tell you, coming here from upstate New York, and I did spend 31 years in Pittsburgh as well, uh, to see the amount of orange that I see in this city <laughs> is an amazing thing, and I will let out, and this has actually gotten me booed in at least one session. And I would have worn a University of Tennessee orange shirt, but they told me I had to wear a tie. And I didn't think I had an ensemble that worked well with that. But I am from Penn State, so I'm used to a lot of blue and white. That gets me booed in this environment. I get that, and I accept that. Uh, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to share a few things. The, the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program is really, and we predominantly produce submarines. Submarines are the silent service. We don't talk a lot about what we do. And there's not a whole lot I can share about what we do in that program, but I can sort of extrapolate and build some bridges into a nuclear engineering program. I think it's very important what the University of Tennessee does from the standpoint that we need in this nation to take the best and the brightest and develop them and assist in their development in the areas of science and technology. If we're to remain strong as a nation, if we're to remain a leader in nuclear power, 
and all the elements that it provides us, we need our best and brightest to be in science and technology. And so for the students here, I'm, I'm excited for you. I'm excited as far as what it means for our future, for the professors and the staff here. As you work to develop that talent, I'm excited for you as well. Because you have the opportunity sort of to give birth and send them out into industry to do the great things that they're going to do for the nation. Now, my career has not been what I expected. I grew up in a center city school. Maybe half <coughs> the kids out of the high school went to college at all. I really came out of a family first to graduate high school. So I didn't really have any vision. And it was actually a teacher that gave me a little bit of a vision. It was a physics instructor. He said, Morgan, you can do this. So I applied to about one university. Didn't know any better. Figured, well, get him off my back. I sent an application. By some miracle, they accepted me. In high school, the only engineering group I ever remember coming in was a civil engineering group. So it's the only thing I knew about engineering. So I signed on to be a civil engineer, and away I went. I really did like the idea of building bridges and roads and buildings. Never did that a day as a degree engineer. As I was getting near my senior year, the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program that Joe was speaking of that really is responsible for our nuclear Navy, every now and then they'd hire a token civil engineer. I'm not sure why, but the call came into my advisor and said, recommend somebody. And he recommended me and they called me. And I went into it really not with a mindset that I'd stay. But it was a good first job, it paid better than some of the other civil engineering job offers I had. And so away I went. And pretty soon days become months, months become years, and four and a half years into it, they made me a manager. And after that, I really never looked back or thought any differently about what I was doing. And so, with that opportunity ahead of me, I was involved during the Cold War era, a different time than when some of you were going to be getting out of college, a very different time. The focus was intense, the pace was torrid, and we were very, very active in supporting the nuclear Navy. And one of the neat things about the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program is that it has a responsibility that we refer to as cradle to grave. We are responsible for the initial development of the technology. We turn that development of technology into a design. We monitor the construction of it. We actually, within the elements of the program, are responsible to acquire that technology. We see it built. We provide technical support throughout its lifetime. And we deal with it when it's time to disposition it and put it to its final resting place. Cradle to grave. What a unique opportunity. One of the things I loved about working in that laboratory environment was you are inescapably linked to the outcome of what you do. 30 years later, you would still get a call. Morgan, what were you thinking in 1978? And you have that complete ownership, which to me was a tremendous thing. And so I really have continued through that time until my phone rang right before Memorial Day weekend of this past year. And I was happily moving along. I had been through the design laboratories. I had been through the procurement prime. I had done a lot of things. We were getting ready to do the final combination of the laboratories. And I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do until I move on to those days that some of us dream of, when we'll do something else other than work. But with that call, really the Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, the boss said, we have a need. I really would ask that you go do that. It's for the good of the nation, not for your good. And that's pretty much what always turns me on, quite honestly, is doing what's important for the country. And so away I went, and now I find myself in Tennessee, first time working south of the Mason-Dixon in my career. Um, not expected, not what I had intended. 
But here I am. Now, consolidated nuclear security is an interesting enterprise. We are involved in the weapons complex for national security. We are involved in a uranium mission. We're involved in non-proliferation missions around the world. We're involved in a lot of things. And the intent of this contract was to sort of take the model that I had been involved with twice before in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program and bring separate entities together, run them as a single business, achieve savings out of running them as a single business, while continuing to deliver the missions that were entrusted. And so we now have put two T states together, Texas and Tennessee in this thing called Consolidated Nuclear Security. And we're trying to bring this together and provide the best value we can for the country while, again, we meet our mission. And so with that, I've got to tell you I'm very grateful for the opportunities I've had. Joe and I were talking earlier. You know, the training that you get in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, I believe, is second to none. And it is that cradle to grave responsibility there are so many things that get imprinted, I would say, on your DNA that are important. And so my intention here tonight is to give you just four attributes that I think have been imprinted, that I think are important, that I would say that as you think about nuclear engineering, as you think about moving forward in what you do, you should think about these same things. Because indeed, I believe that engineering is an extremely high quality an extremely high quality. What we do is so important. When I think about how technology has changed the world in which I have lived, both from the standpoint of the creature comforts and those fancy things that we all enjoy in our personal lives, but as well it changed the literal landscape of the world. It has changed and eliminated in some respects some of the threats that were there, but new threats have arrived. So very, very important. And I would just say to the students, use your time here wisely. Dig deep, dig hard, get prepared to go forward. I'm not going to spend time talking about technical competence tonight, but that is foundational to engineering. If you are not technically competent, you are a hazard to your profession, plain and simple. That's why you have so many professors that invest so much in trying to make sure and take you through the rigors to be technically competent. Because if you are not that, you will create future problems that we can build and afford, especially in a nuclear world. And so really have a focus and apply yourself. I want to start with what to me is one of the most powerful quotes that I am aware of. It's regarding responsibility. It comes from Admiral Rickover. He was the founding father of the nuclear Navy. He served as a naval officer for 63 years, a feat that I doubt will be duplicated in his service and his contribution to the country. But he said responsibility is a unique concept. It can only reside and adhere in a single individual. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it is still with you. You may disclaim it, but you cannot divest yourself of it. Even if you do not recognize it or admit its presence, you cannot escape it. If responsibility is rightfully yours, no evasion or ignorance or passing the blame can shift the burden to someone else. Unless you can point the finger at the man Written in a certain time, the person responsible, when something goes wrong, then you have never had anyone really responsible. At the heart of this is that fundamental belief that someone must be responsible. I actually think that quote is more pertinent in today's age than when Admiral Rickover first delivered it. Because we have increasingly and rightfully gotten into team environments. We work hard to do things as a team. We learn as a team. We solve problems as a team. Around your university curriculum, you are thrown into teams. But there is a huge danger in teams. 
And that is teams can leave holes in the net. Holes where I thought you were responsible and you thought I was responsible. And so this concept of individual responsibility is imperative. That we know who has what set of responsibilities. Because each aspect of nuclear work must have an individual responsible for that aspect. They can't be in the ether. It can't be a hole in the net. It has to have that person that will say, I own it. And ownership is a key word. I own it. I will defend it. I've got this. I will analyze it. And I will deliver on it. And if that doesn't happen, devastating consequences can occur. It is absolutely essential. It's essential in every aspect. It is the foundational principle in my mind, of naval nuclear propulsion work. The finest propulsion program in the world by far. But that is the foundational route. Now, in nuclear work, there has to be checks and balances. That's part of the teaming aspect. You have a strong owner, but you have somebody checking because we're human, we're fallible. It was interesting. At one point in my management career, I was moved to a new group. And I had an engineer in that new group that I was inheriting that I was really questioning something that they gave me to review and sign off. And it didn't look right to me from a structural aspect. And so I brought the engineer in and I said, can you tell me a little bit more about the structural analysis on this piece? And the engineer said, no, that's not my responsibility. We have structural analysts that work on that. And that took me aback. Because in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, we talk about the concept of the consummate engineer. That engineer that owned a particular aspect. Cognizant of all aspects of that design. And I was talking to the cognizant engineer for that particular component. And so I dropped back and say, well, boy, we have a teaching moment here. Because while, yes, you may not be schooled in every aspect of technical analysis that's going to take place on an aspect that you own, you can go off and understand what are the assumptions that went into that analysis? How is that analysis done? What is the output? How does that compare to other analysis that's been done? And you can sort of center and make sure that the results make sense to you. That's part of being that cognizant engineer. And a very, very important part. It's part of that ownership. It was part of that responsibility. And this engineer was missing that. And that's very important. Another aspect of this responsibility is you have to behave like it's yours forever. You have to behave like it's yours forever. You engineer it. And you act like you own it for the long haul. It's not just an assignment to get done and hand off to someone else. That's not the responsibility that Admiral Rickover was talking about. You have to feel like you own it forever. I fully expect that someday someone will stand over my grave when they find something coming out of the NR program and still be looking at that tombstone or whatever it is and say, Morgan, what were you thinking? I'd like you to explain that to me. Because that's that powerful concept of ownership that I feel very much for the work that I've done in the nuclear business. And whether you're touching it for a short period of time, or whether you're really going to have it forever there, you better treat it like you own it forever. It's very, very important. Another aspect that's very important in this responsibility is there are no small problems. A lot of what you're asked to do as an engineer some days feels pretty mundane. You know, I've often thought at times engineers are really white collar, blue collar workers. You know, you're grinding through it. And you're analyzing a lot of things and you're dealing with a lot of things. But there are no small problems. You better pull on the details. You better make sure it's right. You better think through it. <clears throat> Every problem that comes to your desk deserves attention, and you need to provide that appropriate attention. 
It's sort of interesting. <coughs> because when you don't sweat the small stuff, it may come back and get you. And it can have a catastrophic result. Submarine at the bottom is the USS Thresher. At its time, it was the most advanced submarine. It was specifically designed for the Cold War mission. And it was eloquently designed to accomplish that mission. Technology was advancing quickly. We were still learning about submarines. It was launched in July of 1960. It had been out on various sea trials. And on April 10th, 1963, it was out on another trial, and it took a deep dive off the coast of New England, Cape Cod, and it never came out of that dive. 112 military people were lost, 17 civilians. I've had the opportunity to ride a ship on sea trials. It's sort of the ultimate test of your conviction as an engineer with what you put on that ship. Because when you hear that die, it better work. Now, that's a tremendous loss. That's 129 people lost. And that's the consequence of an engineering problem. Now, what was the problem? Unfortunately, when you lose a ship in that deep of water, you're not really sure. You're not really sure. What do we know? Well, in those days, we silver braids piping. And it was roughly 3,000 silver braids pipes on this ship that had to withstand full submarine depth pressure. Shortly before this ship went out on this particular dive, a new technology called ultrasonic testing, not a new technology today, but it was new at the time, was done. And during that time, 145 joints were inspected with this new technique of ultrasonic testing. And of those 145 joints, 14% failed that test. But the test failure was dismissed from the standpoint of it's a new technology. We don't truly understand it. We're not truly, we don't know what it means. But if you take that 14% failure rate and project it over to 3,000, you're up around 400 plus suspect potential for age joints. The belief is that there was a failure. The failure started, it went into spaces that then, with the seawater impinging upon the electrical equipment that would control the reactor, we started to have a degradation of failure. Unable to get to the spaces due to some design aspects to fight that casualty. Other potential problems theorized that you couldn't blow the ballast tanks for other reasons that may have been a problem on that submarine at that time, and the submarine was lost. Silver braids joints, not overly technically complex, likely the cause of the loss of life. And I just wanted to pass something around, because I got to tell you as an engineer, and, and I've lived through a number of of the significant engineering failures that have occurred. And for me, even if it's not in my industry, it's always been pretty personal to me. Because it's, we as a profession failed those individuals in some measure. And I want to pass around, this is from Electric Boat, uh, on the 50th anniversary of that tragic loss. They put together a brochure. I just sent around a few pictures from that. But more importantly, what I want to send around is they collected the pictures of every individual lost from that ship. These were real people. These are people who didn't come home to their families. These are people that never had another day of opportunity in this great country. 
And so it is real. An engineering failure is real. Now, the Navy developed what's called a subsafe program out of that. They went back and looked at design aspects. They went back and looked at how our material is certified. They looked at how do we maintain the continuity of certifications. They did a lot of things because you must always learn from these failures. And so a lot has happened. We haven't lost another. We've never had a reactor that caused us to lose the ship. And a subsafe ship was never lost after that learning experience. But that's a very, very costly learning experience to we'll lose that many lives. Space shuttles, more familiar, we fast forward. In my working lifetime now, I've seen two space shuttles lost. 14 crew in total lost in those two shuttles. One lost over an O-ring. Anybody that's done much design, an O-ring is not, it just doesn't grip you, right? That, is, that isn't what you dream about designing it. When you, when you dream of being an engineer and designing a building site. One loss from foam coming up. And the consequences of that. O-ring and foam. Not very sophisticated. Little stuff. Challenger. Challenger was lost, and, and I do think that these lessons are very, very important, that every engineer has to grip in life, really has to grip and take with them, and take them with them throughout all the days of their lives. But Challenger, there was a question on an O-ring on the rocket boat. And that O-ring, with temperature changes, would lose flexibility, would lose its ability to do its function. That O-ring was designed down to a certain temperature of operation. The lowest that had been operated was about 53 degrees Fahrenheit. A lot of pressure on NASA, right? A lot of national pride in launching space shuttles. Big desire to get it done. Extraordinarily complex machine. <clears throat> About 2,500,000 parts in the space shuttle. O-ring, not really the most sophisticated piece in there, by any stretch of the imagination. But you're coming down to the decision. The weather forecast is it's going to be cold. I've seen different reports down 18 degrees, 8 degrees. I don't know what the temperature was supposed to drop to. But even though I can't hold out a job, my numerics are good enough to know that 8 or 18 is somewhere below 53, which says you ought to have a pause. A lot of pressure. And in actuality, the decision was made, and the contractor, and I, re I reflect a lot on this because I've been a contractor my whole life that has to provide advice to the government on what to do or what not to do. But the contractor feeling pressure made a decision to say, go ahead and launch, despite the objection of the engineering manager responsible for that product. He said no. The contractor said yes. I've seen pictures of the ice. They let water flow all night because it was that cold that they were afraid that other Safety system lines would freeze up. Ice hanging from the structure. And they made the decision to launch in a little over a minute in due to that O-ring not being able to hold the pressures that it had to hold, gases getting by. And ultimately, you can read about it. And there's a lot of different arguments as to exactly what happened. But if you've ever watched the film footage, that thing disintegrated in the air. And the crew was lost. And what happened there? Well, there the, 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 the question got asked wrong in the end. And my third bullet on this slide I think is very important. See, as an engineer, 
always come at it from the positive. Defend why it is acceptable to do something. If somebody flips the argument on you and says, tell me why I can't do that, you say stop. My job is to tell you why it is acceptable to do it. Don't get pulled in to the negative argument and argue the negative. That's totally inappropriate. Why is it acceptable to do something? Extremely important. Extremely important. Go forward to Columbia, the other one that was lost. There, foam comes off. Foam comes off, it's just lightweight foam. It's even turned lightweight foam, right? It's not even heavy foam. It's lightweight foam. But it's hitting tiles, tiles that are heat resistant shield. Because upon re entry, it's hard to imagine to me, technically, but you are withstanding about a 3,000 degree Fahrenheit re-entry temperature on that compound, on that complex machine, and your life is dependent. Well, we know the story. That foam did take out pile. It couldn't withstand the heat, and it burned up in that re-entry atmosphere. What had happened there was they normalized the deviation. And that's another one that's very, very important. If it was not designed for foam to come off, you deal with the fact that it's not designed for foam to come off, and you fix that. You don't just say, well, it's foam, and foam always comes off, and just accept it. Normalizing that deviation. Responsibility, engineering responsibility, is to sweat the source. Get into those details and recognize that relatively seemingly insignificant and small problems can give you a big problem. So there are no small problems. You sweat them all, you deal with them all, you don't normalize the deviations, and don't get twisted around. And you know, it, it's interesting because even good people, very good people, in the heat of the moment because they want to get something done, will twist that question around. To tell me why I can't do that. Tell me why I can't do that. You've always got to take a deep breath, step back, and say, wait a minute, wrong question. Let's talk about why it is acceptable. And I've got to tell you, at times, I've been asked to make judgments on problems because of my position in the laboratory. My position is the final position in the laboratory. It's that simple. It all comes down to what I'm going to say because that's the laboratory position, just like the gentleman that ultimately made the call on the space shuttle. It was his decision. He made that final statement that people were going to operate. And I have more than one occasion said, in my gut, I think it's okay. But we're not paid to operate on my gut. And I don't yet have the proof as to why it is acceptable, and therefore I recommend at this time do not do it until such time as I have that proof. And, and you'll get pressure, and you'll get the heat. But you've got to stay tall in those moments. Commitment. Commitments are really what make any organization go. It's the key to success. It's really the driving engine. And so as an engineer, you're going to get pulled into a whole lot of commitments. Your individual commitments, the organization's commitments. And I would say that if you start out with the view that commitments are promises, and actually professors try to teach you that, right? When the assignment's due, the assignment's due. If you don't get it in, there's a penalty. Because commitments have to be viewed as promises. And you have to view it that way. Now, commitments become an interesting thing because it becomes very complex and intertwined when you're building complex machinery, like we're talking about here. One of my prior responsibilities was to be involved in establishing the design and delivery of the next generation aircraft carrier. So that design was started in the late 90s. Enabling technologies to support that design 
were started much earlier. To get to being able to start putting it into a design in the late 90s, that ship will actually be commissioned this year and turned over to the Navy. So that is a 15 year plus plan to deliver that ship. Or I was involved with was the propulsion. And obviously, I'm vicariously living through an awful lot of people that did all that work as we got that done. So I can't tell you how many thousands, tens of thousands of engineers, technicians, shipyard construction workers, factory workers across the country, and how many tens of thousands of commitments were made. But each individual commitment was a stepping stone along the way to building them. And so it's very important when you face into commitments that if you can't keep it, seek help or relief. And as soon as you know that your commitment is in jeopardy for whatever reason, you better let somebody know. Because if you let them know early, maybe there's a chance to adjust. Now, I'm sure no one in the room has this problem. But I've raised eight kids, so I know it can be a problem. And it's called procrastination. And some people are just wired to put things off. Uh, any of us ever pull an all-nighter? We won't ask for hands, but, you know, it does happen occasionally, right? In the engineering world, when we lay out those schedules, we have got to get on it and get on it early. And if you're going to get behind in this, you've got to let people know. Notify all impacted parties. Do not hesitate. And then remember that bad news does not get better with age. The moment you know it's bad news, you better let people know it's bad news so that you can go deal with it. It's essential. That's how an organization survives. In the end, if you fail to make a plan even for your individual work, you have already planned to fail, as far as I'm concerned. And so you've got to go at it that way. You've got to think about it that way. Now, how do you get respect and trust as an engineer? That technical competence piece? Absolutely. But you know what? If you're not delivering when people need it, they're not going to find you a high-valued asset to their organization. And so commitments are extremely important. Meet them, make them, and follow them. Early in my career, I was asked to go audit a group that wasn't meeting their commitments to the supplier base. When we were getting stuff built, you know, we had certain contractual turnaround times on the engineering documents we received. And when you don't do that, you wind up not only delaying projects, you wind up finding why lawyers get employed and that sort of thing. And so, so you, you need to deal with that. This particular group, the decision was made that they had to go to a six-day work week to catch up. Not a popular decision, but the decision was made. And after about six months, they got caught up. And you know, that organization never again started getting behind on commitments. They lived a different way, where they got out in front of it and got the date changed if they had to, because they couldn't do it. Meet your commitments. Treat them that way. Very important. Candor. Candor is extremely important. Candor, the next dictionary says, unreserved, honest, or sincere expression. Forthrightness. An engineer has to be candid. Absolutely has to be candid. You've got to know your strengths and weaknesses. You have to be willing to say some days, I do not know. You make it up. You fake it. You can create a very, very bad day for yourself and someone else. Candor is absolutely essential. In fact, as you enter the engineering field, if you find you do know it all, you're probably underutilized and you ought to go find another job. Because you will typically find in an engineering environment, if you're looking around and thinking and looking to add value, you're going to get stretched. And there's a whole lot to learn from others that are doing it. 
And it's extremely important that you pursue it that way and think about it that way. You know, it's good to be self-confident, but boy, you have to have an uneasiness as an engineer, I believe. Am I really on solid ground? Do I really have this right? Have I really looked at all aspects? And recognize that a lot of times we know very little in comparison to the body of knowledge that is out there. And we have to be respectful of that. Now, if you're going into a meeting and you say, I don't know, you shouldn't just end it there. You better say, but I'll go find out or I'll go find the person who does know. And take away an action then. And get yourself engaged in that. Because engineering in the end has to be faced based on the facts and the technical acceptability of those facts. I have eye disease. And I'm getting to the point where I need a surgeon. And my hope is that it'll be a good surgeon that he'll know what he's doing, that he won't come in and say, well, you know, I'm not really sure. Sure, hope this works out, Morgan, but uh, here you go, you're going under. We'll, we'll see how it turns out in the end. That's not what I'm looking for. That's not what people look for in engineers. Again, I go back to engineering is a very, very important profession. Tremendous demands and responsibilities are put on that. And we better be candid. And understand that it's not a weakness to ask for it. The weakness is when you won't ask for it. That's when you're weak. Now, the thing about candor is you've got to make known your position. You've got to be strong on that. But as well, if you're going to be candid with others, they expect to be able to be candid with you. So that becomes a two-way street. You have to be able to accept that criticism. You have to be able to accept others providing input into your life. And so that's very important as well. And then when you do make that mistake, you need to be willing to share the lessons from that with others. We don't have time in the engineering profession to have everybody learn making the same mistakes. We build a body of knowledge, we continue to share, we continue to build. And individually we have to be willing to do that. One of the neat things in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program that I always really valued was we have a process called dissenting opinion. And so while everybody in the room is convinced that this is the right decision, <coughs> my two friends in the orange shirt disagree. They have looked at it, they have looked at the same body of data, they have done analysis, they have looked at the other analysis that was done, and they're saying, I don't think that's right. And they are expected to be candid in that. They are expected to bring it to the highest levels of the organization. In fact, in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, in the end, if it was a technical dissent, they came to me as the director of the lab to make the final judgment. But I would hear it, even if it was from a two-month-old engineer in that organization because candor was so important in the nuclear work to make sure we were looking at it and considering all angles. And so know yourself, ask for help, build a solid technical basis, but give your engineering opinion on candor. The sort of closely coupled with this is the topic of integrity. But I'd like to look at it from just a slightly different angle. Because in nuclear engineering, it is unforgiving. I gave you three examples where small problems brought down extremely complex devices. A submarine and two space shuttles. Nuclear engineering is very unforgiving. It has to be very exact. The consequences of losing control of something that you have engineered from a nuclear perspective is a mess. Not only for the people involved there, but reputationally for the industry. 
For those of us in the room that have gone to dyeing our hair gray or removing some of it so we can look something, I don't know what. Remember things like Three Mile Island and what it did to the nuclear industry in this country. The guilt by association shuts it almost all down. It is unforgiving, it is exacting, it is something that we must do. And as engineers, there is a sacred trust put in on us that we will always be <coughs> completely honest, first with ourselves and then with others. We will only present as facts that which we know to be facts. Opinions are nice, they should be substantiated, but don't present opinion as fact, fact as fact, opinion as opinion. Don't confuse the two. Don't represent them differently. Deliver it that way. It's extremely essential. Another aspect of integrity is the willingness to acknowledge your mistakes. You know, it's easy to get into that mind trap. It's not a big one. Don't really have to tell anybody. Just leave it alone. Leave it lie. No. Integrity says completely honest with yourself completely honest with others because of the products that we have. We research, we critique, we study. We do anything and all things to get nuclear power right, to control of nuclear energy. It has to be done with absolute integrity. Again, that's part of that dissenting opinion problem, process that I discussed. If my two friends in orange believe that this is the wrong decision, they have to have the integrity to stand tall and say that I believe is wrong and here is why. Absolutely. It's inherent in our responsibilities to good nuclear engineers. I have been involved in the nuclear industry now getting close to four decades. I go back to the 70s, so I've certainly spanned four decades. I've seen people go to jail in the nuclear industry for falsifying records, for doing things with materials that weren't in accordance with the specification and trying to hide. Uh, very, very serious. Things. Again, because it may seem like it's little. The next time you ever begin to think it's little, think of some space shuttles, think of a submarine. Absolute integrity, absolute honesty. Because in the end, it gets back to that responsibility piece that Admiral Rickover talked about. You have to be individually responsible. You have to own it, and you have to treat it that way. There will be honest errors. Any of us that have engineered much in life have made errors. Any of us that have been managers, have managed people that have made errors. It's all about how do we react to the error? How do we learn from it? How do we rally around it? How do we recover from it? But for sure, we do not hide. We do not try to burn it. In the nuclear world, we try to build a lot of processes and systems that backstop many, many things. But at the end of the day, it all goes through human hands. We are human, we are fallible, we have to face that fact of our lives and live with absolute integrity. That we will do everything we can to get it right, and when we don't, we'll let others know. This uh, quote by <coughs> Warren Buffett, in looking for people to hire, you look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. And if they don't have the first, the other two will kill you. And I believe that to be absolutely true. Absolutely true. Because in fact, that energy and that intellect will probably get you down a really bad path in a hurry if they don't have the intent to match. There are no do-over parts to it. When you have a catastrophic loss, you can't bring those people back. Unfortunately, the nuclear deck doesn't give you the do-over part. It just doesn't. And I don't think it ever will. So with that, before I wrap it up, I'd like to open it up for any questions. <coughs> if 
before I hit a wrap up slide. Okay, go ahead. Well, no, I, I have the mic. Uh, you're the runner. I'm the runner. Uh, we have a yeah, I'll be the other runner. Runner one and runner two. Runner one. Uh, Jeff Chapman. Let's see. Lab. Uh, so, uh, the slides, I love, I love your slides. Your message was very, very clear. I uh, appreciate the, the reference to Admiral Rick Over. I interviewed with him in 1979 and bought my first share of Berkshire Hathaway A stock in 1981. <laughs> it was a little pricey then, and still is today. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, uh, found myself working on the, on the shuttle recovery team back in 1986, March of 86 through June and July of the next year, 87. I think that's when we put the, the next bird up. So uh, I think I've followed failure, engineering failure, uh, in a number of uh, ways. Uh, the fire in Rocky Flats, uh, that was part of the Rockwell contract. And, uh, and then I'm following several different, the whip issue here recently that happened this past year. And that's a big one, that's gonna come back to bias. I think I'm really, really paid for those issues that occurred last February at WIP for the disposition of transuranic material in this country. Uh, having said that, I, I guess I would uh, I'd be candid with you. I think that was one of the requirements. And say that I think one of the problems we have today in engineering is we swept the smaller stuff. And not only swept the small stuff, but we, we, we swept the smallest, smallest, smallest stuff. And that is what I mean by that is uh, anybody sitting in this room who's done a, a vulnerability assessment for security. Anyone who's done a PRA, probabilistic risk assessment, you end up with engineers, <coughs> statisticians, debating what is small enough. And so what I what I would like you to consider addressing is when do you say when? I think we're all sweating, at least in my uh, I'm in my fourth quarter. I'm probably not going to go to overtime. Uh, I'm in my 34th year. Uh, however, you know when do you say when? When is it? When is it? We're all sweating the small stuff, and I think I've heard so many students here and sitting in this room say, I've got to figure out a way to get my figure of merit on my NCMP run down to less than 0.1 or 0.001 or 0.2, and I'll do whatever it takes to do it. And so you're sweating that small, 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 small stuff. Meanwhile, you have other things you haven't considered that, you know, it's, it's, it's so big, you're, you're embarrassed that you missed it. That's a great question, and uh, if I ever get invited back, we'll go into the next phase of this series. But no, I, I think it really is when is enough is enough. And, and I do think that the, the other aspect of engineering that you can talk about is the art of engineering. And the art of engineering is when do I have enough data to say I can move forward and make a decision and go forth. I think one of the problems that we have in some regards today is that as we have become increasingly refined in our ability, we can go deeper and deeper and we can get to the point where it is not a value-added activity. Because if in fact going to more significant figures will not change anything else, you let it go and move on. Um, and so, so I do think that that's part of the judgment that you develop as you, as you grow in your engineering career. I think that's part of what an organization has to decide as they go forward and try to set the parameters or expectations <coughs> on how far we're going to go. Because if I know that I am safe, that I am in a safe zone, I should be able to move on and go look for what's the next fish to fry where I get some payback. And so I agree with that assessment. Um, and, and I do think that that's part of the art of engineering. I mean, I, I could still be working my first engineering project working for all of the perfection. I wouldn't be employed, wouldn't have been paid, but I could theoretically be doing that. And that is a piece of, of, the, of it that you have to get. So I agree with your observation. Uh, and I do think that uh, that this balance is something that you've got to figure out because all of engineering is a dynamic balance and a dynamic tension. Uh, just one quick follow-on, closer to home now. Uh, so what are we going to do with this seismic qualification debate for UPF? Which is, the 
art and the science of design, right? For engineering design. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. I agree with you because I've done a lot of seismic work over the years. And at some point, you have to pull up and say, OK, I'm going to go with this set of assumptions, which is part of engineering, and, and do what is practical and come at it. Now, Fukushima didn't help us in this role relative to looking at those sorts of situations. But again, after Fukushima and other areas, I had to go back and relook at seismic studies and, and come to some conclusions. And sometimes there's other safety systems you can put in and think about that are offsetting, that are more cost responsible than going for the infinite that you could be driven to. But uh, we've got to figure out that balance, and I guess I wouldn't profess that I have an answer here today. I've always said it's a thousand times better than what you have today in 9212, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I understand <laughs> that. I totally and I'm not here to discuss 9212. <laughs> <laughs> So let, me, let me also note for the students in the room the discussion of significant figures, which yeah. those of you who have had the, pro, pl the pleasure of having me for class know that's the quickest way to get a big red mark on your papers when you <laughs> write down every single yeah. number the calculator gives you without thinking about it. So, so I'll, I'll give you two significant figure discussions just so you think about it. One was, because I was doing engineering before there was such a thing as computer-aided design systems. And there was a requirement built into contracts that anything with three significant figures had to be recorded, any piece of data. Now, that was built into contracts because in those days, if you put three significant figures down after a decimal point, you were really, really serious because stuff used to get tolerance with things that would like a one slash an eight or a one slash quarter or something. Well, come find out that after you built CAD systems, everything had three significant figures. So they're recording dimensions of chamfers on the bottom of CAD screws, lock wire holes. I mean, everything under the sun was getting recorded. And that wasn't the intent. It had lost its whole view of what was significant once we wanted to get. Other thing, trick one of the college professors did on us, because I actually go back far enough if you know what a slide rule is, doing math on two sticks with a crosshair. Not eloquent, but it would work. And he would start his fluid dynamics course with, I'm going to give a test on the final exam that 90% of the class will miss because you now have calculators. And he told you what it was going to be. It was going to be submerge a ball and have it come out of the water. And of course, everybody with calculators in his mind would punch in Brownian motion, which doesn't really describe a big ball, but that's what they would punch in, and their ball would come out of the water at about Mach whatever. And, and uh, but the calculator said that was it. That's all the significant figures. No comprehension of the number on a slide rule. You really did have to think about were you in a rational zone or not. And, Sure enough, 90% of the class missed it. I did not. I paid attention that the first day of class. The first day of class is very important, actually. It's not just a blow-off thing. So, uh, but, you know, so significant figures are very, very important. It's amazing to me how we can estimate the cost of a nuclear reactor down to three cents. It really is amazing to me in today's world, but I see papers like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question. Bruce Williamson, I work with uh, Howard and Joe and the Institute for Nuclear Security. Um, I'm intrigued by your comment about the cradle to grave uh, perspective of designers and engineers who staff the nuclear reactor programs, or naval reactor programs. And the reason is um, that is just one relatively small component in the total nuclear, or sorry, the total uh, weapons defense acquisition program. Uh, I think what, we're up to about 100 and 70 billion dollars a year on, on weapons procurement. Uh, but the problem in those programs, uh, quite in contrast to the example you're given, uh, giving, is um, program managers are only have a tenure on those programs of, on a, 
think on the F-35, I was calculating about uh, three and a half years. On some programs, they're only there for two years. And I've heard over and over anecdotally that the idea is if there's a problem, I'm not going to let it surface on my watch because I'm going to something else. So tell me more about this, because human behavior has an important right. part of that. The behavior of the engineer and the willingness to accept responsibility. Tell me more about that program management and uh, naval reactors. Okay, well, program management there is, well, well, it's interesting because in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, that we really have endeavored throughout our history to hire new grads and grow them and, and do like I, a lifetime career. So, you, you, so the mindset is, it's going to be your first and only job. It's becoming more challenging in today's world. But we're going to, so, so historically it's been built on the basis that you're in it for the long haul and that because you're in it for the long haul, it's inseparable from you. You can't get away from it because even if you move, you will get contacted and you will be found out. But that's why to me, I stress on that word integrity there, because I, I think that kind of thinking is really wrong, and I worry about that. I, I worry about it even in, in, in my own job, you know, I, I'm, because, you know, it is easy, and I'm going to be careful not to go into just an entire political commentary, because I'm sure I'll get thrown out. But, but it's a problem for a nation when everybody is thinking just short term. And if I can just endure it through my whatever period it is and make it your problem, I'm going. Not on my watch, right? It's on yours. And, and, and so to me, another word that I would use if I was to come back would be a word stewardship. What does that mean, stewardship? See, I think we have to view ourselves as stewards, not as program managers. If I'm the program steward, stewardship to me implies it goes on forever. And so I, I do think it's a problem, and I, but I think it's part of that management DNA that, that I, I mean, and that's why I go back to that rip over responsibility quote, why to me it's always so powerful. Because it, it becomes an inseparable part of your being. And you can't divest yourself of it. If you come at it with that mindset, that I will never divest myself of that ownership, then you come at it a different way. But it's a personal decision. And I think increasingly, as a country, we get away from that level of integrity, that level of a view of responsibility of what we're doing. Because anybody working the stockpile, any of us working on this complex technology, we would sure hope that technology outlasts our time of touching it. Uh, I mean, it would be unfathomable to me that you would think otherwise. So therefore, have that stewardship and that enduring ownership. Yes? Yeah, in terms of um, your yeah, personal procedure and, and your affiliation. Oh, please. sorry, I'm uh, still in Dallas. I, I'm on the nuclear engineering department, also of nuclear security. I work with um, Dr. Hall and Mr. Bach. So yeah, in terms of um, operational procedures, and uh, trying to uh, be objective. How do you manage um, whistleblowers during the Cold War and in the present times when you look at it from uh, the angle of nuclear security? How did I manage with? How, how do you manage um, whistleblowers in terms of your operations? Oh, whistleblowers. whistleblowers. Yeah. Okay. Steve, or your well, team. you know, number one, you have to be very clear what is security level information and what is not. And you are required to protect that information. As well, you build internally strong systems to, again, I described it the setting opinion approach earlier. You build strong systems where it can surface and adjudicate, and it can go to the very highest authorities that are involved in the decision making to make sure that you have driven it to ground. So 
So you try to build inherent systems in place and approaches that avoid someone believing that they have to go do the whistleblowing. But in fact, in whistleblowing, they have to be careful what they share and don't share from the standpoint of that information. Because again, to me, protection of national security information is another stewardship that we have that is incumbent upon each one of us that are willing to go through the gate and sit down in a chair and do that job. <coughs> and so you really try to build the systems, you try to build the openness in the work environment with widely known processes. I mean, this dissenting of opinion process, for instance, that I described, it is written down. You can go to the XYZ procedure and read it for yourself. It's not just folklore, it's not just behind the scenes. I may whisper it to you so you know it exists. No, it's out there. We train people on it. We train people on it day one. Uh, in my case, at the laboratory where I was at, I did a session called a heritage session with every new employee. I emphasized some of the things similar to what I emphasized here relative to their responsibilities. We want to hear from it. In fact, one of the reasons why I believe it's so important to bring people in from universities and get that new talent in is you come with a fresh perspective. You know, after I've done it a certain way for a long time, it's hard for me to see doing it differently as open-minded as I'd like, I think, of doing it. But when you come to me and say, you know, this makes no sense, and then I actually have to try to explain it to you out loud, maybe it doesn't make sense to me anymore when I hear myself say it. And so that's the value of bringing new people in and strengthening the organization. So I don't know if that helps, but that, that's pretty much the type of approach. You try to create an environment where you adjudicate it within, and no one can be silenced prematurely. Now, Mr. Finley, if I can quote you from earlier in our conversation with Sam, is it? It is, Matt, yes. It really is. It's, you know, that, that's, you know, it's sort of interesting. We, we can come together. And because of that kinship that we have from all those years working in that same program, we can finish each other's sentences even though we may have been out of that program a long time because it's embedded as part of the family and it's really on your DNA. It becomes an inseparable part of your being, I'm afraid. Which drives your spouse nuts sometimes. So, so great topics here from engineers, but let me ask you to extrapolate to the, the challenge that engineers face when they get out in the workforce and they discover that not everyone else in the workforce is an engineer. And engineers now have to talk to lawyers or human resources people, <laughs> trainers, uh, public affairs people, all, all other different walks of life that, that don't necessarily, this integrity slide might actually be the anti-lawyer slide. So how do you, <laughs> how do you deal with people whose worldviews are so different as an engineer? Okay, do we have to run the tape on this, or? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can board it out. <laughs> well, again, to me, when you build the organizations in a nuclear world, you have to build that environment for all disciplines. Uh, you, you have to absolutely build it for all disciplines within there. And, and some of it is, uh, like much of the nuclear work, in our country is done under contracts in the United States government. Now my belief is you must execute those contracts with full open disclosure. Um, and, and there's no way around that. Yes, there are contracts that have to be adhered to. There are attorneys that are going to evaluate aspects of those contracts. But if you do a good job, you actually build this thought into every employee in the organization. And that's essential that you do it, in fact, so that they can help you uh, communicate. As it so happens, our public affairs manager is here tonight watching me to make sure I guess I don't go too far off track. But I would, I, I would, and I've known Jason for a number of years even before I came to Y12. And I know we share the same value set on how you do that. We absolutely share that same value set. Because again, we've worked for a company as well that has embedded that because of the nature of the work that they do. And so, again, I think in any company you have avenues. It, you know that if you feel you are being pushed in a direction that doesn't seem right, you have an avenue to go see an ethics officer. You have an avenue to go to appeal to a manager. You have an avenue, and any good company will have those avenues to deal with it. And if you find yourself as an engineer that you are being asked to compromise. 
and you can't get satisfaction, I think you've got to find a new company that can't get it done. That's my simple <coughs> view, no matter what that is, because it is too important to get wrong. So, so let me turn the question a little bit slightly. When you become the manager, as you did four and a half, five years in your career, and you have these sort of people working for you, what skill sets do you apply? How do you handle that? As far as different disciplines? Different disciplines, people who may not share this vision of integrity, well, this vision of candor, and so forth. Again, you sit down and you have those conversations when you find it. And as a manager, at some point, if you can't move someone along who will not share the values of the organization that you deem important, you have other recourse where then you are talking to attorneys and human resources. <laughs> but, but you have to go deal with it. Uh, because, in a sense, as a manager, if you allow cancer to develop in your organization, th that responsibility rests with you. You know, that you have now allowed it to create. And I think sometimes, you know, it is very easy as a manager, this would be another part of a different series, but it is very easy sometimes as a manager to blame your people for everything. And if you find yourself having to blame your people, you better be pointing at yourself because you, you're, you've created something in that environment that's making it there. And so one of the things I've always done is try to set a very open environment and make sure that people know, you know, if, if you believe I am asking you or someone else is asking you to do something you believe is wrong, raise that right away. Be candid. Let's talk about it. Let's have the candor. But I, I do think you have to work and instill the value sets incumbent upon all the people that you want to operate. And as well, I believe that you have to look at that in your recruiting very much. I mean, one of the things that I look for very vigorously in recruiting is what is the value set of the individual that I am bringing into the organization before they're ever there? It, it, it's interesting. One of the techniques I always used was I would interview people, and I would actually make sure that there was a time delay at the end of the interview. I would not have someone staged to get you out of my office, even though I'm an introvert and it would be more comfortable if you would leave me. Uh, I would purposely have you hung up there to sort of shift the gears and see what you have to say. And it's amazing how I've had people over the years that would say, you know, this has been a great day. I am so glad I called off sick where I work to be here with you today. My integrity meter would go off the chart, and that person was not getting a job offered because, to me, that was an integrity issue. And, and so, so I would look for it very hard, and we would set up in our recruiting process a look for the value sets as well. Because it's better than, because that, if the person is not going to, share your value sets when you're hiring them in, you're also setting them up for a frustrating job as well. I mean, everybody's going to lose in the end. Because they're going to be frustrated, you're going to be frustrated. It's just not going to work. So spend the time up front and try to clear and screen the value sets before you ever get them in as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, you know, so I'm listening, and I'm, I get deeper and deeper into the culture of, oh, yeah, of nuclear security and all this, the more I listen to people like Howard and, and you and others, it seems to me that um, it's just like Plato said long ago, that uh, if you teach someone, if you give someone a power of something, he was talking about the power of oratory, without a comprehensive system of philosophy so that they're a person of integrity, you can create a monster. And he used the example of uh, a gymnast, you know, training someone to be extremely strong, you just create this very strong person. He says, they'll go out and Mug people, you don't know what they're going to do unless you also train them to be a good person. And you give them proper philosophical basis and ethical training and so on. And it seems to me that's at the heart of uh, a lot of these questions. You know, engineers, especially people dealing with kind of the pinnacle of, seems to me, of stuff that's potentially dangerous or potentially is a blessing, nuclear stuff. And there has to be a way for the other people who are not, Plato would say, shipbuilders or cooks or specialized, they have to have a way to put into the minds and hearts of the rest of the public enough information, enough, uh, enough expertise so that they can involve, Plato would say, everybody's business is politics. 
Not everybody can be a shipbuilder. Not everybody can be a nuclear scientist and so on. But everybody is involved in the body politic. So a big part of what he was always trying to figure out, how can we bring enough of the expertise knowledge into the minds of the non-experts so that everybody can function together as a police, as a city, that, that prospers and is safe. And so, so this very thing happening here, I mean, this is very helpful. You know, lay people begin to get some understanding, and lay people vote for politicians, and they vote, you know, it all works together. But ultimately, for this stuff that, for engineers and scientists controlling this material, we trust you, we have to trust you. You're the medical doctor, you are the people who know it and are in. You, if I may say so, sir, have excellent ethos. You know, if you're helping build the ship of the proposal, I might be willing to write it. You seem like a person of great integrity. And I think that is the key. And the more the public understands and can see and hear people who have that integrity and the expertise, th that trust is built and in an organization and in the larger organization of a, of a body politic. Hey, you're right, and that's why you know, I emphasize so much of that you do have to do the engineering so well because it takes a long time to build trust. It takes a very small thing to destroy it. Yeah. And, and so we have to remain excellent all the time before we destroy it. Especially in today's world where in, in some respects you see less of a compelling need for some of it than maybe we saw for those of us that grew up in the Cold War era, for instance. Where if you have a great enough enemy that you perceive as a big enough threat, you will endure more than you would if you don't see it that way. Or you don't see the need. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Jonathan Gill. I work for uh, Dr. Hall, a PhD student. Um, I'm interested in a comment you made a little earlier about uh, taking in those new graduates and sort of growing uh, engineers within the community. And this might be a bit of a broad question, but within the engineering community, uh, do you see anything where we might be bleeding a little bit or uh, dangers or hazards to continuing to grow and foster stewardship and these values within the community that uh, are important to recognize and possibly mitigate or change for the future, sort of developing issues that would challenge us? I think that's a great question. I, I, I think there are several challenges. One is, uh, A, we don't even produce that many engineering students. So, I mean, for what the nation needs, we don't produce that many. Because we have become a society that a lot of times will take education, if you will, I'm going to get in trouble here, but I'll say it, an easier path. And, and so, so, A, we don't produce enough. B, in the nuclear field, for those that come out as a nuclear engineer, by and large, you want to do nuclear engineering, you have a fairly limited job field. But a lot of the nuclear engineering work is done with a broad spectrum of mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and on and on and on. And, and, and that broad spectrum will go many, many different directions, not necessarily staying just within the nuclear field. And so we have, a, we have an issue today of what I would refer to as knowledge management. That knowledge management being passing on from one generation to the next, but having the next generation that will stay around to actually have that knowledge and use that knowledge in each of these discrete work sets that we have to get work done. And so I think that's a huge challenge. Um, and, and then I think beyond that, and, and I'm sort of a, you know, I understand millennials and X and Y and all that, but I, I believe people are people. You can find people of differing types in every generation. And, and so, as we work with engineers, we have to work with each person as an individual, not as with a label that they think this way because they're of this demographic, that, that age. And so I believe it, it takes a lot of engagement constantly within an organization to keep people energized and, and growing and being mentored and feeling like they're a valuable part of the team or that family as we go forward. 
And so I think that, again, that's part of the environment we have to create to be successful as well. And, and, and that's just imperative. Go ahead. Uh, my name is B.J. Marshall. I work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, a few years back, I worked at Noel Common Power Laboratory. Uh, and my question for you from a, a management perspective is you made a comment about if you're a two-month-old engineer, you've got to own it. You've got to bring the heat. You've got the integrity. You own it. You convince anybody you're right. Mm -hmm. How do you convince all the managers between you and my boss that they can trust me to know that? We had a situation where there was an issue in the shipyard and we weren't entirely sure where a reactivity control device was. said, so what do we do? So we'll We've done that analysis. We did that analysis in 1994. We did that analysis in 1996. We did that analysis in 1998. I did that analysis last week. We're good to go. It's fine. Well, well why don't you just run one more calculation and, and find out? So, well, we don't need to. We've done it. Well, would you go to your boss and say that? Surely. And you're not going to my boss and say that. Would you go to his boss and say that? Absolutely. OK, fine. Would you go to the GM and say that? Absolutely. I'd go to Admiral Bowman and tell him, it's OK. We've done this. Two weeks before that, I've been at the lecture about you kids today. You just want to run another job. You don't want to understand what's going on. And here I was trying to make the argument based on understanding what we were doing. So how do you how do you deal with risk aversion and nobody wants to trust the young punk and and which I was. I, I was not the most respectful human being on the planet. Um, but how do you how do you drive that? backward from from you need to be from when you're young you need to be responsible to when there's someone who's younger than you who's telling you something you need to be able to trust them too yeah I, I think it comes back to uh, to me as a young engineer you prove yourself over time in that ability and you are going to get pushed back at times and you're going to have to go an extra mile to prove it to prove you're right um, and part of that is just the tenacity in building that trust as to why someone should trust you, uh, even though you're standing firm. I mean, I think from your description, I would suspect I was much like you when I was a young engineer. Uh, and, and because I believe very firmly that the work I did was right, but I would always take the balls and say, okay, if the boss is going to challenge it, I'll go back, I'll double down, I'll prove it to you. Even though to your question, it may seem like a waste. But sometimes that was almost, I have found, at least in the program that we're describing too, at times a test of your metal. A test of your metal. Because one of the things that I always appreciated was at the end of the day, if it had to be explained as a young engineer, I would explain it to the highest powers. And at least I had that opportunity in that program to go do that. Uh, but it, it's, I think it's really, it's enduring through that and, and building that confidence and faith so that over time it, it should come down. There's also an aspect that uh, not every boss is a good boss. All right? And, and so not every boss has figured out how best to work that relationship and, and, and develop people appropriately and gain confidence in people the right way. And, and so sometimes that can just be a bad relationship too. That's one of the things that's intrinsic in engineering. Many of us as engineers aren't the best of bosses because of some of the personality disorder I guess we share as engineers. But, but have you seen risk aversion like sorry. Have you seen risk aversion like that as you move higher up in the organization? Sure. Are sure. You, and then how how have you overcome that in your career where you know, now you're, as a civil engineer, being asked to sign off on some nuclear design calculation that some 22-year-old kid is telling you is fine. H how do you turn that around and say, yeah, I, I, I have faith in that kid without, you know, everybody on the line saying, yeah, he's good. If it's just you and me in a room and I'm 22 and you're not quite 22, um, how do you, and again, how do, you, how do you manage the rest of the people under you to accept risk on occasion because we can't be absolutely certain, but we can have the facts that say, it's okay, let's go forward. Yeah, I think for me, a lot of it as a manager over the years was 
getting knowledgeable in what I would call comparative engineering. In other words, I would look at what did that look like for other designs, and if what you were providing seemed like was in bounds and you could, you could explain to me your assumptions, how you went about doing the analysis, here's the results, I could do some comparative I I examination and, and ferret it out, I'd go with it. By the same token, and I can give you an example one time, uh, we were given data and we were off churning and working hard because it was a crash, we had to change the design. And, and I'm trying to figure out from the engineering manager, why are we putting all this into this? And so I simply said, get me some drawings of similar designs. And I kept looking at it, and it, had, and it looked the same. It was the same materials. I know it had been used successfully for 20 years. And eventually I called the chief metallurgist in this case, who had enjoyed his dinner while we were working, <laughs> and was at the bowling alley. And I got him from the lanes, and I basically said, I'm sending everybody home because there's something wrong with this data that you have us working on. And it turned out they had misread a logarithmic scale. And so, and I didn't get there because of brilliance or anything else. I got there because of comparative engineering and if it didn't smell right, didn't look right, I said, time out. We're not doing anything until I can now see the actual data. And as soon as that guy tried to explain the actual data to people, it fell apart. And then we got on the right course. So some of it's instinctive. I relied a lot on comparative engineering and then my testing of the validity of what I thought the person did and, and went for, with it from there. And as well, typically there was other checks and balances always that other people had looked at it and you should have some measure of confidence. Uh, now, in any program as it matures, I believe it becomes more risk averse. And so that is something that happens and you came in at a much more mature state <laughs> in the program. And yes, there is increasing risk aversion I think there's become increasing risk inversion in some respects across the country, leading to the question of why we go increasingly after other things. Sure enough, I, we're we're at seven o'clock. That's it, Morgan. Let's give it Morgan a round of applause. Well, I got one more slide. Yeah. 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 Okay, for the college students, this is the freebie. All right. <laughs> I have learned over the years never end on questions. Because if the, if the person that asked the last question takes, that, takes you down a rabbit hole that you can't get back out of, that's all anybody will ever remember from your meeting. Because they stuck you down a rabbit hole. So I always come back with one more slide, it's mine. I want you to reflect on this quote. Teddy Roosevelt. Again, written in a certain era, but it's not the critical counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Engineering involves daring greater. Nuclear engineering, those that went before us, an admiral rig over with some tablets of paper, a couple technical papers and slide rules, created something that is unbelievable because he was willing to dare greatly. It's inherent in what we do. There'll be failures along the way. You have to dare responsibly. You've got to do it that way. You've got to be responsible for your work. I think Teddy's hitting on that. You've got to make that commitment to give it your best and deliver on what you promise. You've got to have the candor to speak up and admit when you're wrong. And you have to have absolute integrity in everything you do. If you do that, you'll have a great career. You won't always be popular, 
which will make a difference. And in the end, that's what engineering is about. Thanks. Thank you.